Good morning again. My name is Jose Casanova. I'm a professor here at Georgetown in sociology and a fellow at the Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace, and World Affairs. And I'm very pleased, and it's my privilege, to chair this session and to present the speakers and respondents on dignitatis humanae in the future of religious freedom. Again, I think a document that radically, radically uh, uh, revises the traditional position of the church and probably very closely related to Nostra Aetate. You could not have probably Nostra Aetate without religious freedom and vice versa to a certain extent. Um, the keynote speaker this morning is Professor Linda Hogan. Uh, her bio is in the program, so I will not go through it, but she is Vice Provost and Chief Academic Officer as well as Professor of Ecumenics in at Trinity College, Dublin. Um, her primary research interests are in the fields of theological ethics, human rights, and gender, and she has published uh, uh, largely on all these three issues. Most recently, Keeping Faith with Human Rights, coming, uh, published at Georgetown University Press this year, 2015, and feminist before feminist Catholic uh, theological ethic conversations in the world church with uh, Marinol Orbis Press. Uh, she has played an important role editorial board of many, many different journals. And we are very pleased, pleased to have Linda here this morning with us to give us the keynote on Dignitaris Humanae. Thank you very much, Jose, and let me begin by saying what a pleasure it is to be here at Georgetown to participate in this conversation about the legacy of these three extraordinary documents, Nostra Aetate, Dignitatis Humanae, and Gaudium et Spes, and to consider aspects of their unfinished agenda. My task this morning is to reflect on the unfinished agenda of Dignitatis Humanae specifically, but I expect that many of the themes that arise in terms of its reception and its continuing agenda are likely to echo those all, uh, already uh, considered in relation to Gaudium et Spes and Nostra Aetate. I would like also just to, to mention at the outset that I have slightly changed my title uh, on the basis that I was asked to give one so I could maybe amend it as I uh, reflected on the import of, of the task. And so I'm going to be talking about Dignitatis Humanae, the future of religious freedom and the global common good. So Dignitatis Humanae was finally approved on December the 7th, 1965, the last working day of the Second Vatican Council. It was a remarkable accomplishment, both theologically and politically, and the final vote of 2,308 in favor and 70 opposed belies the depth and the extent of the opposition that it initially faced. Moreover, its influence has been transformative, and its agenda is as vital today as it was on the day of its promulgation. I come to Dignitatis Humanae as a theological ethicist, one who's grappling with the questions of whether and how citizens worldwide can go about the task of building a shared political life in which human dignity and flourishing are to the fore, and what role the religions and specifically Catholicism can play in the articulation of these ethical commitments. We know that our collective fate is more closely tied than at any time in our history. Almost daily as citizens, we encounter issues that no government can successfully deal with by itself. The challenges of sustainability, nuclear and chemical proliferation, migration, terrorism. And so it is ever more important that we create a global political politics premised on the protection of human dignity and flourishing. Now, I believe that the creation of such an emancipatory politics is vital for our planetary well-being, and that religious traditions have a significant role to play in this. However, the, the task of the creation of an emancipatory 
politics is a complex and multifaceted one, one on which political scientists and legal scholars have deliberated for decades. It's my view, however, that such a politics cannot be created through the classic liberal mode of agreement by avoidance, but can only be constructed through inclusive, tradition-thick, cross-cultural and multi-religious conversations through which human dignity can be secured and through which agreement on the contested issues we encounter can be pursued. So given that our global and local conversations about human dignity and flourishing are shaped by the irreducibly, irreducible plurality of human experience, including religious experience, our political cultures must have the capacity to facilitate such intercultural and interreligious exchange. Of equal importance, however, is the capacity of religious traditions to be part of this deliberative process, a pro process in which there is mutual respect for the convictions, including the religious convictions of the other, and in which there is mutual appreciation of the ethical, and val ethical values embedded in these discrete and varied traditions. Indeed, since religious pluralism has become entangled with the politics of fear, which threatens to undermine the toleration that has been achieved in many parts of the world, it's ever more vital that religious traditions, including Catholicism, are to the fore as we go about the business of building a politics focused on the global common good. And so it is from the perspective of a theological ethicist uh, that we see here that I see the crucial a crucial dimension of the unfinished agenda of Dignitatis Humanae, one that is not only vital for the church, but also for the global common good. So Dignitatis Humanae, I think, created a new theological context from which the church has been able to engage with the reality of religious and cultural pluralism. And I will discuss this in the first part of my paper. I will next briefly discuss the nature of global politics today in order to demonstrate why it's more important than ever that the church continues to reckon with religious pluralism and to affirm its value. And then I will go on to suggest that Dignitatis Humanae has only just begun a process that must be continued, highlighting in particular that an important part of the unfinished agenda of Dignitatis Humanae relates to how the church engages with the ethical truth claims, as well as the religious truth claims of the other. And I will argue that the same trajectory in respect of ethical pluralism needs to be pursued, as has been, albeit haltingly, adopted in respect of the religious truth claims. And it is only then, I think, that the church will be a credible voice in articulating a vision of the global, pub global public good in a pluralistic world. So the first part, Dignitatis Humanae in its historical and theological context. The Dignitatis Humanae made a remarkable journey from its origins as the final chapter in the initial draft De Ecclesia to its position as one of the most celebrated documents of a council that itself was groundbreaking. It's all the more remarkable, however, when one understands both the immediate and the historical context of its promulgation. Dignitatis Humanae opened with the acknowledgement that, and I quote, people nowadays are becoming increasingly conscious of the dignity of the human person. A growing number demand that people should exercise fully their own judgment and responsible freedom in their actions and should not be subject to external pressure of co or coercion, but inspired by a sense of duty. At the same time, to present excessive restrictions of the rightful freedom of individuals and, they demand, uh, and the demand of constitutional limitations of, excuse me, they demand the constitutional limitations of the power of government. The council declared these demands to be greatly in accord with truth and justice and moved immediately in section two to declare unambiguously that the human person has a right to religious freedom. Freedom of this kind means that everyone should be immune from coercion by individuals or social groups and every human power, 
so that within due limits, no men or women are forced to act against their convictions, nor are any persons to be restrained from action in private or in public in accordance with their convictions in religious matters. The Council further declared that the right to religious freedom is based on the very dignity of the human person as known through the revealed word of God and by reason itself. This right of the human person to religious freedom must be given such recognition in the constitutional order of society as will make it a civil right. Now 50 years on from its promulgation and over 60 years on from the UN Declaration of Human Rights, such an affirmation, though welcome, may not seem particularly groundbreaking or controversial. And this may be especially likely to be the case in the US, where even in 1965, Dignitatis Humanae effectively described the modus operandi of the US church in respect of the state and the state in respect of the church. In 1965, however, in the historical and theological context of its promulgation, it was both groundbreaking and controversial. A great deal of energy has been expended in the debate about whether Dignitatis Humanae's confirmation of the right to religious freedom and the obligation on states to legislate for that represented an evolution or a revolution in the church's teaching on religious freedom. And we'll likely discuss this in due course during our conversation. It's clear, however, that whether revolution or evolution, it did represent a significant change from the political posture that the church had adopted during the long 19th century. That is, from the time of and in response to the French Revolution and its aftermath, particularly in Europe. And it opened the way for a gradual evolution in the church's theological assessment of other religious traditions, including their ethical claims. The shape of the church's thinking on religious liberty evolved over many centuries. The Constantinian era inaugurated an approach which assumed that unity in religion was essential for political peace and stability. And it was only post the Reformation in Europe when the Peace of Westphalia established the political arrangement of cuius regio eus religio that the issue of the political right to the free expression of religion began to be explicitly, if only occasionally, discussed. The issue gathered pace in the post-Enlightenment period, but the manner in which it was debated varied widely in different political contexts and depended on the extent to which religious and political identities converged or diverged, on the presence or not of significant minorities, on the extent and rate of migration, and on the political and legal structures in the different states. The immediate reaction of the Catholic Church to the political philosophy of the French Revolution is well known. Not only did Pius VI Sixth declared that it was anathema for Catholics to accept the 1789 direct declaration of the rights of man and the citizen, stating that this equality, this liberty so highly exalted by the National Assembly have then as their only result the overthrow of the Catholic religion. But Gregory XVI in 1832, in the 1832 encyclical Merari Vos also strongly condemned liberalism, individualism, democracy, and also freedom of conscience, of speech, and of the press. And of course, Pius IX's syllabus of errors reinforced this further and listed as a set of erroneous propositions, uh, amongst them being, first, the belief that man is free to embrace and profess that religion which guided by the light of reason he shall consider true, that the church ought to be separated from the state and the state from the church, and that, the present, and that in the present day it is no longer expedient that the Catholic religion should be held as the only religion of the state to the exclusion of all forms of worship. And indeed, well into the 20th century, one could be in no doubt, both theologically and politically, that there was very limited, if no recognition of the right to religious freedom. In fact, it was explicitly rejected. 
Now, the 20th century saw significant theological and political debate about the relationship between church and state, as it was called then, driven primarily by theologians and, to a lesser extent, conferences of bishops in jurisdictions that were de facto pluralistic, the USA, Canada, UK, and parts of continental Europe. There was particular unhappiness with the contradiction, one might even say hypocrisy, of on the one hand, the church promoting human dignity and constitutional government, and on the other, holding fast to the idea that where the Catholic church was the majority church, then the state should not tolerate other religions. Many theologians and Catholic politicians believed that this was an embarrassment to the church that could no longer be tolerated. And through the 1950s and 60s, theologians, as you know, like John Courtney Murray, Jacques Maritain, and others, began to develop the theological principles that would allow the church to draw on other aspects of the tradition to affirm religious freedom as a right. Others who were concerned with ecumenical and interfaith relations, uh, about which we heard earlier this morning, also developed the theological discussion in other important directions. So Dignitatis Humanae made two essential theological claims, both of which, as I said, were already present in the tradition, but which were given particular prominence such that they enabled the bold and positive statement about religious freedom against the immediate backdrop that seemed to to exclude such a position. First, it claimed that by virtue of, be, of their being in the image of God, imago Dei, human beings have an inherent dignity and a calling to seek and follow the truth that, that is, manifest, that is manifest, made manifest to them through their consciences, and that no government could obstruct this as long as it did not impinge on the common good. And it insisted that the act of faith must be free and sincere, and that the freedom to follow, one, follow one's conscience on matters of faith is possessed by everyone. Now, of course, Pachim and Terrace, issued in 1963, had already effected an important evolution in respect of the right to religious freedom. And it did so, actually, by drawing on similar or the same theological resources. Pachim and Terrace included the right to freedom in in searching for truth and the right to honor God according to the sincere dictates of one's own conscience, uh, mentioned those as the rights to which all human beings are entitled. And it proclaimed human, that human rights flow directly and simultaneously from the nature of the person and are universal and inviolable. Moreover, it had also asserted the value and visibility of the language of human rights as the way to protect human dignity in the political sphere. And so when we look at the political impact, I think, of Dignitatis Humanae, one must also see it in the context of the, the, the uh, imperative of uh, Pachim and Terrace, which was framing the discussion in the context of rights. There was, of course, deep opposition to Dignitatis Humanae as it was being debated during the Council. This opposition, which it eventually withstood, focused on two main objections. The first was that it represented a significant change in the Church's teaching. The second was that the commitment to religious freedom as a value that flowed from the dignity of the human person would foster subjectivism and religious indifferentism and that it ran counter to the position that the Catholic Church was the only Church of Jesus Christ. Of course, it's very important to acknowledge here that there is an ambivalence, one might even say a contradiction, inherent in the document as it relates to the right to religious freedom. True, Dignitatis Humanae asserts that it is in accordance with their dignity that all human beings, because they are persons endowed with reason and free will, and therefore bearing personal responsibility, are therefore impelled by nature and bound by the, a moral obligation to seek the truth, especially religious truth, and that they are also bound to adhere to the truth once it is known and to order their whole lives in accord with, its demand, with the demands of truth, 
However, also in parallel, it asserts that this leaves untouched traditional Catholic teaching on the moral obligation of individuals and societies toward the true religion and toward the one Church of Christ. And also, um, one must note the, um, the earlier um, uh, uh, statement of Dignitatis Humanae, really very early on in the first uh, paragraph, uh, about um, the council professing its belief that God himself has made known to mankind the way in which men are to serve him and thus be saved in Christ and come to blessedness and that they believe that this is that this is the one true that that this one true religion subsists in the Catholic and Apostolic Church so there is, as I say, an ambivalence, one might even say, uh, a, 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 a contradiction here. I think commentators and, and theologians through the decades have accepted that there's no logical or necessary conflict between these two assertions. But nonetheless, they do represent two different trajectories in terms of the epistemological and theological core of the tradition. The one gesturing towards an inclusivist approach, the other towards a more exclusivist one. And I would say that a comparable ambivalence can be seen in many of the other council documents and also in the politics of their reception in the tradition, especially in relation to how the primacy of conscience is treated. So Gaudium et Spes, for example, speaks of conscience as the person's most secret core and sanctuary and affirms that deep within their consciences, men and women must discover a law which they have not laid upon themselves and which they must obey. This is an articulation that chimes well with Dignitatis Humanae's statements that all persons are bound to seek the truth and to embrace it and hold, it, hold onto it as they come to know it. But by contrast, um, encyclicals like Veritatis Splendor defend a far more objectivist approach to moral truth when it asserts that the church has, a right, has the right always and everywhere to proclaim moral principles, even in respect of the social order, and to make judgments about any human matter, a position that chimes with the um, trajectory of Dignitatis Humanae's statement about the moral duty of individuals and societies towards the true religion. There is no doubt, however, that those who objected to Dignitatis Humanae on these grounds were correct in seeing where the significance of the declaration lay. The recognition that the right to religious freedom is a cornerstone of a just society was indeed a departure for the church, particularly not only in lands where the majority population was Catholic. It did pave the way for an evolution in how the post-Vatican church post-Vatican II Church approached the crucial issue of religious pluralism, although for the most part the impact of the evolution is seen much more clearly in how the Church engages with the plurality of religious beliefs and is not as evident in how it contends with the pluralism of values. However, whether it is an instance of aggiornamento, of development, or of resourcement, to reference John O'Malley's characterization, and notwithstanding the more traditional assertions about Catholicism as the one church of Christ, there is no getting away from the fact that the church was set on a very different path in respect to pluralism in the aftermath of Dignitatis Humanae. So while the Second Vatican Council was in session, sociologists and political theorists were effectively insisting that religion would become an ever more marginal factor in the lives of citizens. However, trends over the last two decades suggest otherwise. Indeed, the recently published uh, report on the future of the world religions by the Pew Research Center suggests not only that the decline has been halted, but also that religion will continue to be a phenomenon with which we have to reckon for many decades to come. The report projects how glo the global religious landscape will look in the year 2050 if current trends in demographics continue, incorporating patterns of religious switching and exit. And it shows that those with a religious affiliation will make up an increasing share of the world's population. 
However, we also know that this trajectory is a complex one and is not adequately captured through the simple categories of religiosity and secularism, since uh, another Pew report on global religious diversity in 2014 suggests that religious diversity within and across countries is also an extremely important feature of the global religious and political landscape. Of course, human beings have always lived in the midst of diversity, religious, moral, and political. Nonetheless, as Charles Taylor's A Secular Age highlights, and as the Pew data suggests, what is distinctive about contemporary pluralism is that it's not just one factor amongst many, but rather it is the determinative feature of late modernity. It's further complicated, moreover, by what um, our chair, Jose Casanova, has described as the deprivatization of religion and the related phenomenon of the repoliticization of the private religious and moral sphere, each of which has accelerated in the last two decades and the impact of which has been felt across the globe, not only in the political sphere. So religious believers, like other citizens, expect to have the opportunity to express their views on matters of critical public interest in the context of the accepted deliberative processes of the polis. They also often expect the religious institutions to which they belong to play a role in influencing public policy on critical ethical issues. Moreover, the issues of greatest concern to citizens, whether they belong to religious traditions or not, and on which they seek to influence policy decisions are often those that are construed as belonging to the private religious and moral sphere, but which in fact, uh, I think this characterization is very unhelpful because uh, the distinction between private uh, and public in this uh, regard uh, really doesn't um, uh, uh, capture the way in which uh, citizens think about their, these pivotal issues. Because there are few, uh, many of the debates on which political, uh, uh, many of the political debates on which, uh, w which are at play here, one can see they, these are issues that are both simultaneously public and private. And it's inevitable that um, uh, we see that there are few issues that are more obviously simultaneously political and private than issues like a living wage, marriage equality, migration, abortion. And so it's inevitable that citizens motivated by different theological and philosophical worldviews will forward a diversity of perspectives on the meaning and purpose of human existence, on the values by which individuals ought to live their lives, and on the nature of the human goods by which, uh, uh, through which a society ought to order itself. So given the likely incommensurability of some of these conceptualizations of the good, a crucial question has to be how a political community can be built amongst people with diverse religious and philosophical commitments. And from the perspective of the Catholic tradition, the crucial question relates to the resources we have to engage with, or even to be at the vanguard of this ethical project. And it is here I want to suggest that we can see the untapped potential of Dignitatis Humanae. And so to the, the third section of my paper, freedom of religion, ethical pluralism, and the global common good, Dignitatis Humanae, the unfinished agenda. Dignitatis Humanae, perhaps more explicitly than any of the other council documents, recognizes that diversity is structured into our nature as human beings. And from its claims can be read a recognition of the goodness and the integrity of the different moral and religious traditions. Now, I appreciate that this may be a contested reading, or perhaps it's more accurate to say an over-interpretation of the Declaration of, uh, on Religious Freedom. And indeed, it's che the checkered history of the reception of Dignitatis Humanae would suggest that this is probably the case. But notwithstanding the ambivalence inherent in the document, however, Dignitatis Humanae did indeed affect a significant transformation in the church's approach to religious pluralism. And much progress has been, has been seen in this regard in the last five decades. 
It has also, I would suggest, created the conditions for a new way of engaging the deep ethical pluralism that characterizes contemporary life. And this, from the perspective of an ethicist, is the most crucial dimension of the unfinished agenda, and in some senses has been the most neglected. Dignitatis Humanae tells us that it is in, the, in accordance with their dignity that all human beings, because they are persons endowed with reason and free will, and therefore bearing personal responsibility, are therefore impelled by nature and bound by a moral obligation to seek the truth, especially the religious truth, especially religious truth, and that the search for truth must be carried out in a manner that is appropriate to the dignity and the social nature of the human person. By free inquiry, with the help of teaching or instruction, communication and dialogue, it is by these means that people share with each other the truth they have discovered or think they have discovered in such a way that they help one another in the search for truth and the human person sees and recognizes the demands of the divine law through conscience. And there are many ma other conciliar texts, as I said earlier, particularly in Gaudium et Spes, that advance this approach. Indeed, taken together, the texts of Dignitatis Humanae and Gaudium et Spes, and their recognition of the post, uh, and their reception in the post-Vatican II Church, have played a formative role in affecting an evolution in the way in which the nature of moral truth and the discernment of conscience have been understood. Thus, in the post-Vatican II era, and as a result of the Council, there has been a move away from the act-centered, legalistic moral theology of neo-scholasticism towards a more biblically-based, historically conscious and context-sensitive framework. This has had profound ramifications for how the church understands the nature of moral truth and how the person comes to understand and apprehend the moral truth. And I think it is important here also to say that Dignitatis Humanae speaks consistently about seeking the truth and the search for truth. But it also has untapped potential in terms of the church's approach to ethical pluralism. Uh, it must be acknowledged, however, that although Vatican II did inaugurate a paradigm shift, as we heard yesterday in this regard, this has been deeply contested. One strand of the tradition stresses the objectivist, universalist nature of moral truth, and the other has stressed a more contextualist, pluralist nature. Nonetheless, the post-Vatican II Church, influenced, like influenced by texts like Dignitatis Humanae and Gaudium et Spes, and reinforced further by feminist and post-colonial voices, in that church there has been a much greater appreciation of the formative role that the person's historical and cultural positioning plays in how human beings come to know the truth, and a recognition that traditional universalist moral frameworks are replete with hidden assumptions about what is good and right and natural for human beings. So my proposition really is that Dignitatis Humanae, along with texts in Gaudium et Spes, has the potential to underwrite and reinforce the church's evolving understanding of the nature of our truth claims. This is, is a discussion that was begun by Demmer and Lawton and Janssens and developed by Farley, Cahill, Hollenbach, and others. Uh, and it, it is really based in a contextualist, situated understanding of knowledge and recognizing that our moral reasoning is tradition dependent, that we are creatures of tradition and history, and that our expressions of value, our accounts of the good life, our apprehension of the virtues, our practical reasoning about how to li live a dignified life, these and all of our other deeply held convictions emerge from the communities we inhabit and become our own through the worldviews we encounter and through the narratives we construct and reconstruct. Within such a moral framework, the discernment of conscience is properly cognizant of the fact that it is shaped by context and cultural inheritance, as well as by socio-political and other factors. So we are formed in the context of our communities, 
within the currents of discursive traditions and through our interactions with the world around us. Our moral claims, as well as our religious commitments, emanate from and reflect that situatedness and are expressed through our indigenous languages. Moreover, when we seek to justify and explain and communicate our positions to the, each other, and when we seek to adjudicate amongst competing moral positions, we do so against this backdrop. Inevitably then, when we admit the contingency of our search for and apprehension of the truth, uh, the issue of subjectivism and relativism is raised. And many continue to worry that once the contingency of our search for truth is conceded, there will be no firm ground on which to stand and from, which, and from where one's moral values can be established and defended. And indeed, this is precisely what Dignitatis Humanae worried about and tried to avert through the parallel statement that the recognition of the obligation to seek the truth and to follow one's conscience left untouched the moral duty of individuals towards the true religion. I think that such an anxiety, though understandable in 1965, is in fact misplaced because it is possible to acknowledge that rationality is contingent and justification is always contextual without also endorsing a relativist and subjectivist position in respect of truth. Rather, one can defend an ethical framework that is simultaneously realist in respect of truth while contextualist in terms of justification. And so the revisionist strand in theology and especially in theological ethics of the post-Vatican II Church provides, I think, a particularly sophisticated and nuanced framework in which this approach to justification and adjudication in ethics can be advanced. It acknowledges that our ethical discourse with its values and commitments is constructed and narrated through the cultural and religious worlds we inhabit, and it proceeds with the recognition that our values emanate from such contexts. In doing so, moreover, it allows for, indeed encourages, the church to engage in the kind of ethical debate that is vital for our global well-being. Importantly, however, this does not mean that we have to give up on the idea of the truth of our moral positions and of the rightfulness of our moral convictions. Nor does it mean that we must give up on the conviction that certain claims have a purchase that are wider than the context from which they have originated. We can indeed defend a moral realism while acknowledging the embedded character of our moral understanding. However, the moral realism on which finite human beings can depend is a fractured one. It's a realism that is based on the acknowledgement that while our identities are shaped by the material and discursive conditions of our lives, and while the ethical judgments we make are inevitably shaped by the historical and religious context of our moral formation, we can nonetheless strive to embody the virtues and excellences that we have come to believe respect the best that human beings can be. It means that we must be prepared to explain, justify, and defend the convic our convictions. Excuse me. It means that we must be prepared to explain, justify, and defend the conviction that the way we treat one another matters, that human beings have an inherent dignity, that our social order and political structures must function to protect this dignity, and that those who are especially vulnerable must be the focus of particular concern and protection. The manner in which we do this, however, is very important. And um, the uh, virtue of civil speech in public discourse is absolutely vital here. So I'd like to uh, conclude by suggesting that any durable consensus on fundamental values will have to reckon with the deep religious and ethical plurality that inevitably shapes our conversations, global and local, about how human dignity can best be protected. For Catholicism, the approach suggested and enabled by Dignitatis Humanae still has great untapped potential in terms of allowing us to have a different kind of conversation about why certain of our views are so deeply held, what fundamental values they express, 
and why they are of such elementary significance. And so it is in this context that Dignitatis Humanae has only just begun a process that must be continued if the church is to be a credible voice in articulating a vision of the global public good in a pluralistic world. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Hogan, for this wonderful uh, reflection and uh, deep probing into the tensions and the possibilities of the text and how, uh, particularly in our global condition of pluralism, uh, how it has to be itself uh, taken into account. We have two respondents. Uh, the first one is going to be Professor David Hollenbach, um, who is University Chair in Human Rights and International Justice and Director of the Center for Human Rights and International Justice at Boston College, a sister and rival institution from Georgetown. But he likes us a lot, and he spends a lot of time here with us. <laughs> so uh, I'm very pleased uh, uh, this, this semester David is a fellow at the Library of Congress, so we have the privilege also of having him around us. I had the privilege of working with uh, David in the last three years on a project on the Jesuits and globalization, and I very much appreciate all his work. As you know, he has been one of the most important voices and uh, um, uh, uh, thinkers on issues of human rights, on issues of refugees, and issues of immigration and the ethics of precisely uh, those aspects. He's consultant with the Jesuit Refugee Service and has also spent a lot of time in Africa doing work on human rights and, and, and refugees. So please, David. Thank you very much, Jose, and thank you very much, Linda for, Hogan, for a really fine paper. I, it's a great uh, pleasure to be able to uh, respond to you, and I hope that we can follow uh, my response and the other coming response with some good dialogue about this. As Linda has shown, there has surely been a, a dramatic shift in Catholic approaches to religious freedom uh, over the past uh, 50 years since the Second Vatican Council. And I find in particularly helpful her argument that the same trajectory that Vatican II adopted in its treatment of religious diversity now needs to be followed in addressing ethical diversity as we grapple with the global reality of the common good in a very interdependent world like we face uh, these days. Let me sketch uh, an aspect of such an approach that seems particularly important in the United States today. Uh, during his recent visit to the United States, Pope Francis made a notable contribution to this development, I think, uh, of, by helping us advance from the explicit teaching of Vatican II to where we need to be today, where the, I think Francis is helping us move forward on the uh, unfinished agenda of Vatican II. He did so specifically and most explicitly in his speech given beside the Liberty Bell in Philadelphia when he visited here uh, just a short time ago. There he f affirmed that religious liberty, quote, makes possible the ideal of interreligious dialogue. Religious liberty, the Pope implies, provides a framework of mutual respect among diverse religious communities that enables them, quote, to join their voices in calling for peace, tolerance, and respect for the dignity and rights of others. In other words, religious freedom, in the Pope's view, makes dialogue possible among the diverse religious communities of our world with different understandings of the good life, enabling them, therefore, to work together for peace, justice, and the preservation uh, of the earth. 
I think this is very much in line with the direction uh, that Linda Hogan has suggested um, Dignitatis Humanae has pointed us. Francis uh, went further in stressing the importance of this dialogue among diverse traditions when he told the United States bishops in Washington that, quote, dialogue is our method. His commitment to such dialogue was then on full display when, during his visit to New York, he prayed for peace and justice alongside the leaders of all the other major world religions at the memorial to the 9-11 terrorist attack on New York, an event that was quite dramatic, it seems to me, and uh, very much an event that echoed uh, what um, Pope John Paul II did at Assisi, but Pope Benedict did not want to do at Assisi uh, with religious leaders from other faiths uh, uh, at that point. So the commitment to respect for the freedom of others and to active dialogue with the communities that are different from oneself is extraordinarily important in the world of today, as Linda Hogan has indicated. And it resists the idea that is frequently rather common in the United States that respect for religious freedom requires that religious faith be kept private. Catholicism has long rejected the idea that faith is simply a private affair. Vatican II, indeed, saw faith as a public reality that requires that the church be deeply engaged in efforts to alleviate the griefs and sufferings of people of our world. Indeed, Vatican II proclaimed that it comes within the meaning of the free exercise of religion that, Christ that communities of faith be enabled to express their vision of how we should live together in society. And that, so this is far from a private reality. So seeing religious freedom as opening the door to dialogue with those who are different, therefore suggests that religious freedom is not, first of all, a way of protecting the church from the allegedly corroding forces operative in the larger society. Securing the church's freedom is not way, a way to protect it from being dirtied by compromise with those who hold religious or moral convictions that are different from the church's own. Rather, religious freedom, instead of resisting compromise, opens us to engagement with those who are different, with people who, that we differ from, so that we might work with them and discover how we might live uh, together. I fear, however, that in very recent years, the U.S. bishops have been somewhat too inclined to see the argument for religious freedom as a way of defending the church's capacity to follow its own convictions rather than uh, a way of opening the church to engagement with those who are different, an engagement that might lead it to critical examination uh, of some of its own traditional positions. The dialogic approach to religious freedom suggested by Pope Francis is quite different from one that sees avoiding compromise as the first requirement of faith. Seeing religious freedom as protection of faith against compromise is a more Baptist understanding of religious freedom than Catholic one, it seems to me. Now, I have great respect uh, for Roger Williams and what he did in Rhode Island in his respect for both Native Americans and for Jews, but one thing is pretty clear, and that is that Roger Williams was not a Catholic. And I think this view of religious freedom as protection against those who are somehow different uh, is unfortunately not the direction uh, in which Catholic thought about religious freedom should be moving. And indeed, it's certainly not what 
Pope uh, Francis stressed uh, in Philadelphia. Some U.S. Catholic institutions, however, and some bishops are today moving in a way that seems to make non-compromise the essential meaning of religious freedom. Some U.S. bishops and some Catholic institutions are on their way to the Supreme Court of the United States right now, uh, where they plan to argue that being asked to even sign a letter that would enable them to be exempt from the mandate of the health care bill, uh, the, the uh, Affordable Care, Care Act, uh, which requires uh, providing uh, insurance for people that would prov provide coverage for contraception, that even signing a letter to become exempt from that is too much of a compromise. Uh, and therefore, they are arguing that their religious freedom uh, is a way of protecting them from that kind of compromise. That's why I suggest that this is quite different from the way Pope Francis would want to argue that religious freedom is an openness toward engagement in dialogue with those who are different rather than a protection against excessive compromise. It's a very distant move, it seems to me, uh, of that, that approach to the, from the move that Pope Francis has suggested. So I think that both uh, Linda Hogan and I would argue that Pope Francis's more dialogic, engaged approach to what religious freedom makes possible is in tune with the teachings of the Second Vatican Council, and even more, it's likely to enable the church to make a contribution to the global common good, and indeed to the good, the good of our own country in the church's ministry today. Thank you. Our second respondent is Sister Sayon Ewart, is a member of the Sister of Mercy of the Americas and is the Executive Director of the Resource Center for Religious Institutes in Silver Spring, Maryland. Besides MAs in Liberal Arts and Administration and Supervision from John Hopkins, she is a Doctor in Canon Law from a Catholic University and has played uh, important roles as uh, uh, president of the Canon Law Society of America, as consultant to the US Conference of Bishops, executive director of the Canon Law Society. So maybe we'll get the voice of a Canon lawyer telling us how to behave. <laughs> Thank you very much. I really am delighted um, to be at this important conference and especially grateful to uh, Dr. Hogan for her excellent paper, which she shared with us um, earlier, and the, uh, her reflection on the continued importance of the teaching of Dignitatis Humanae on religious freedom in today's church and the world. Recently, an ethicist and I gave a joint workshop on a developing theological issue. One of the first questions asked of us was, where do your presentations intersect? How does theology and canon law relate to one another? And which one is more important and, or has priority? In response, we tried to say that each discipline is important and necessary. They work together as a unity, each retaining its own characteristics. Theology is more reflective and gives meaning to the law. Canon law is more concrete and provides norms for action that deal with what exists. However, law must be grounded in theology. Father Ladislaus Orsi describes this relationship as a single process from vision to action. In my reflection this morning, I would like to respond to Dr. Hogan's paper from the perspective of a canon lawyer and offer some comments regarding the articulation and protection of rights within the church and the influence of dignitatis humanae in this arena. 
As Dr. Hogan stated, that five decades ago, after the promulgation of the Declaration on Religious Liberty, the significance of the document continues to unfold. Recognizing the divine origins of human dignity, since human beings are created in the image of God and called to serve God, Dignitatis Humanae presents the foundation for human rights, especially the right to religious freedom in accord with truth and justice. Though the Declaration on Religious Liberty did not explicitly address the question of rights within the church, its renewed consciousness of the dignity and rights of the Christian faithful surfaced early in the process for the revision of the Code of Canon Law. Prior to the Second Vatican Council, the question of the existence of rights within the church generally received a negative response. In fact, two decades prior to the council, some prominent authors said that individual rights had no place in the church whose public order was directed to the salvation of souls. The council, however, brought to the attention or brought to the internal order of the church a new awareness of the meaning of human rights. It spoke about religious liberty, public expression of opinion within the church, conscience, associations, education, just wage, and more. On January 25th, 1959, Pope John XXIII included the revision of canon law as one of three projects he initiated as part of his ambitious program of renewal. He appointed the Commission for the Revision of the Code in March of 1963 to begin the process. Subsequently, however, Pope Paul VI's decision to delay the work of revising the Code until the conclusion of the Council was a wise and prudent one, which enabled the Commission for the Revision of the Code to be guided by a broad set of guidelines entitled Principles Which Govern the Revision of the Code of Canon Law. These principles were proposed by Paul VI and approved by the 1967 Synod of Bishops and later echoed in the 1983 Apostolic Constitution, Sancre Discipline Legis, which introduced the Revised Code. These principles aimed at ensuring consistency between the revised law and the council's doctrine. They called for an articulation of rights and guarantees for their protection. Three of the 10 principles provided important considerations for the question of rights in the church. For example, the first principle identified the juridic character of church law and indicated that the preeminent an essential object of canon law is to determine and safeguard the rights and obligations of each individual person, person with respect to others and to society to the extent that this can be done within the church as it pertains to the worship of God and the salvation of souls. The sixth and seventh principles directed that the revision of the code is to acknowledge, define, and articulate the rights which persons possess by natural law, divine positive law, and their proper juridical condition in the church. The code is also to safeguard such rights and provide effective means for recourse for their vindication. And it became clear that the bishops of the 1967 Synod desired a new code that emphasized the fundamental equality of the faithful with the creation of appropriate administrative and judicial processes that would protect the rights of persons from any arbitrariness in church administration. John Paul II underscored in Sacre Discipline Legis that which concerns the duties and rights of the Christian faithful to be among the significant new elements recognized by Vatican II, which he, which he said characterized the true and genuine image of the church. 
Another principle for the revision related to the issue of rights in the church called for an emphasis on authority as service. In Sacre Discipline Legis, John Paul emphasized this contribution of the council and described the promotion of the common good as an essential service of ecclesiastical authority. Dignitatis Humanae asserts that the common good consists chiefly in the protection of the rights and in the performance of the duties of the human person. Gaudium et Spes describes the common good then as the set of conditions under which each person can achieve his or her perfection. In light of this teaching, the protection of the rights of the faithful cannot be a peripheral issue for those entrusted with the service of leadership in the church. Rather, it is, in, as it is an integral aspect of their efforts to promote the common good within the church. In their service to the common good, church authority has the duty and the right to moderate the exercise of rights by the faithful in the interest of the common good. However, judgments to restrict the exercise of rights by ecclesiastical authority should take care not to base decisions on the advantage of the institution or personal preferences rather than a genuine discernment of the common good. As an example, we might think of how the actions of some church leaders acting unilaterally in response to the clergy sexual abuse crisis mistakenly judged what in fact really constitutes the common good. With the promulgation of the code in 1983, the church's social teaching entered into and began to influence the church's rules of discipline. With an unmistakable Bill of Rights codified in Canons 208 through 223, the rights of the Christian faithful were thrust onto the agenda of canonists. Canonical rights had not figured notably in canonical reflection prior to the revision of the code. So following its promulgation, some commentators attribute the emphasis on rights in the code not to canonists, but to Pope John XXIII and the development of Catholic social doctrine prior to and during the council in Mater et Magister, 1961, in Pachim in Terrace, 1963, and especially in Gaudium et Spes and Dignitatis Humanae in 1965. The fontes, or the sources of the canons of the Revised Code, reflect the teaching of the Council and provide tools for the correct interpretation and application of the new law. Though they arise from different sources, rights exist in the Church and are exercised in fundamental communion. Dignitatis Humanae presents the dignity of the human person as the foundation of hum for human rights, Council also taught the fundamental equality because of the dignity bestowed by baptism. No matter what our particular vocation, we share a common dignity as the people of God and the same call to holiness. This fundamental equality is reaffirmed in legal form in Canon 208. The law, the full implications of this changed focus continue to evolve even 32 years after the promulgation of the code. Equality in dignity should lead, all, should lead to activity whereby all cooperate in the building up of the body of Christ in accord with each one's own condition and function. Such activity is a participation in the church's mission. For example, participation, shared responsibility, and common responsibility are terms that frequently have proven to be difficult to put into practice. The use and effectiveness of participative structures in dioceses is, is uneven at best. Without structures of participation that serve the communion of the church, the Christian faithful are deprived of the opportunity to participate in the inner life of the church. Dignitatis Humanae also addresses the protection of rights stating that the common welfare of society consists chiefly in the protection of rights 
and in the performance of duties of the human person. Here again, the implications of this teaching about rights for the church as a society are present. The church cannot retreat from its fundamental obligation to promote and protect the rights of its members. Although it is generally considered that procedures for vindicating one's rights through administrative recourse and judicial tribunals are adequately provided for in the Code of Canon Law according to the demands of justice. At least we have to say they're not absent. It is nevertheless the experience that over the three decades since the Code's promulgation that administrative recourses are lacking considerably in church practice and in the administration of justice. Prior to the promulgation of the Code, this satisfaction with existing procedures for protecting the rights of the faithful prompted experiments with alternative methods of resolving disputes. For example, in 1969, the then National Conference of Catholic Bishops approved a document entitled On Due Process, which provided procedures for resolving intra-ecclesial disputes between members of the faithful and administrative authorities in the church. Although the procedures were widely adopted and adapted in the dioceses of the United States at the time, the experience of using the procedures to resolve contentions over rights has been most disappointing. The remedy available to the faithful when conciliation and arbitration break down is the procedure for hierarchical recourse, which gives the faithful the right to make recourse to the superior of the one whose action has injured or threatens to injure their rights. While this remedy has potential to improve the quality of justice in the church, its procedural norms must be followed carefully and pre precisely if it is to be successful. Let me conclude at the, at, at, as the meaning of dignitas humanae continues to unfold. Its implications for the articulation and protection of rights within the church will also evolve, for it is central to the mission of the church. The 1974 Synod of Bishops made a pointed reference to the reform of canonical procedures in stating, from her own experience, the church knows that her ministry of fostering human rights in the world requires continued scrutiny and purification of her own life, her laws, institutions, and policies. In the church, as in other institutions and groups, purification is needed in internal practices and procedures. Human rights have validity within the church. However, the agenda for defining and guaranteeing the rights of the faithful in the church remains unfinished. Challenges include revisiting and embracing more fully some of the principles that guided the revision of the code, reconsidering some of the qualifications and restrictions on the exercise of rights that can obscure their substance, improving existing or developing new processes, procedures, and forums to, to assist the faithful in vindicating and defending their rights in the church. The church will be judged by its practice its proclamation and its protection of the rights of the Christian faithful will only be credible if it is perceived to be just and merciful itself. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, Sister Sharon. Uh, before opening up the floor for conversation, questions, discussion, let me add a personal contextual footnote on the reception of Dignitatis Humanae because I think this is very important. Uh, as I mentioned yesterday, I was a young seminarian in Spain, 1965, uh, when all these three final documents uh, uh, came out. The Spanish bishops in unison went to the council believing that the Franco regime was the paradigmatic model of a Catholic political and social order. And the whole Vatican Council, but especially this document, Dignitatis Humanae, was a bombshell 
for the Franco regime. Before, when, when uh, uh, Jean Borelli mentioned that Paul VI was Francophile, well, he was Francophile, but certainly not friend of Franco. Uh, his election to the papacy was also received by the regime as a bombshell. I'm saying this because without it, there may have been no transition to democracy in Spain, the way it was. It's a consensual, peaceful transition. Uh, it was the Church of Franco. It was the main ideology of the Franco regime, and now a very serious Catholic opposition to the regime as possible. But not, not only in Spain. In Latin America, the majority of Latin American countries at the time of the Council had authoritarian regimes. And from 74 on, beginning in Portugal, Greece, and Spain, and then throughout Latin America, basically one authoritarian regime after another fell down, and you have basically consolidation of democracy throughout the continent. This would not have happened without the discourse of human rights that were incorporated into Dignitatis Humanae and that played such a crucial role there in papal encyclicals and in every then pastoral letter of bishops in every country in the world. So I think it's very important that we recognize the uh, world historical uh, uh, influence of these documents and political developments in Catholic countries throughout the world. Uh, if I would ju just add to that, that that is precisely why I wanted to stress that um, in 1965, and when one thinks about the US context, uh, it was very different because that was already de facto the, the context. But in Catholic majority countries, the impact, uh, the political impact of Dignitatis Humanae over the decades has really been transformative. And in the Irish context, I would uh, say the same thing. So please, uh, I cannot see very well because of the blinding lights, but please raise your hands. There is a hand there behind. Please. Uh, please identify yourselves as you made the questions. Hi, I'm Matthew Shadel from Marymount University. Um, I want to refer back to John Borelli's talk from this morning about the questions that remained unasked mm -hmm. in Dignitatis Humanae, but now maybe we are asking. And that's both the... Uh, Linda and David talked about religion not only being free but also public, but we come to the public not just as individuals but as members of communities, participants, and institutions, and it seems like a major question now is what, what is the relationship between religious freedom and institutions like schools, hospitals, uh, businesses. So do do these institutions have religious freedom? And I think it also makes us ask, what does it actually mean to be religious? Maybe we assumed we knew, but we really didn't. So it was both addressed to Linda and to David. Um, yes, thank you very much for the question. I think it's, it's exactly uh, one of the critical questions that we have to contend with. Uh, I, I, so I think Really, um, the way we ask this question um, and the import of the question is different in, different, diff in each political jurisdiction because obviously the, the laws of the land uh, construe the relationship between the church and the state differently. And so the question about um, the, uh, whether uh, um, church institutions, wh whether the right to religious freedom uh, extends to public in church institutions is, I suppose, a question that arises differently in different political contexts. But I would say that, um, of course, uh, human beings express their religious convictions in political in, in, in institutions, and they expect those institutions to play uh, a, a, a public role in a deliberative democracy. That's absolutely, and, and I think we cannot get away from that. Uh, faith is a public uh, uh, matter as well as a private matter. The question for me, though, is what kind of approach Dignitatis Humanae uh, uh, suggests to us in terms of the posture of religious traditions and institutions vis-a-vis -vis this question. And uh, I, as David was suggesting and as I would, was, was also arguing, it has to be a dialogical one. It cannot be one where we either claim that right for ourselves, 
irrespective of the impact that it has on the, um, po uh, on the political context or indeed on other traditions' cl uh, right to make those claims. Uh, so so it, it cannot be about my claims for religious freedom without recognizing the reciprocal uh, uh, um, claims, that, that, that the, the reciprocal duties that one has within, a, uh, within a, a, a democracy to recognize those claims of the other. Um, so, so I think it, it's really key that we sort of recognize that it is a, a, a dialogical model that we, we need to be pursuing. I also, though, want to say that we must, in, in this deliberation, practice virtuous speech. Uh, you know, the mode in which, the way in which we engage must be um, one that recognizes that the way we make these claims must also be virtuous, that it must have the, the virtues and the excellences that, we, um, that are part of the Christian tradition inscribed in the way in which we carry on this conversation. Would you like to add something? Well, I, w I would just, one very brief comment would be the Second Vatican. The De Dignitatis Humanae is very clear that there are institutional dimensions <laughs> to religious freedom, yeah. that each community has the right to appoint its own ministers, for example, or that each community has uh, the right, and that the claim that communities have the right to appoint their own ministers is not acknowledged in China today, for example. Getting a Catholic bishop put in place in China is not easy. Uh, because there are restrictions. So it's that kind of limitation on the church's ability to exercise its own life and its own ministry is a corporate reality, not just a private personal reality. But then the question becomes, when we say we're going to implement uh, a set of guidelines about the behavior of Catholic hospitals, if the hospital is the only hospital that can provide health care in a certain region, it also then has to pay attention to the fact that there may be people that it's providing health care for who are not following Catholic doctrine. And therefore, it's how does it deal with the doc engagement with those people? And, and so the, the, there's a, that's where the dialogue comes in, into play. Yeah. And to presuppose that we know all the answers to what a, a Catholic institution should do without engaging those people who are affected by the institution. Mm -hmm. It would be a mistake, I think. Right. And I mean, maybe let me add, it was Kearney Murray that made a crucial point that the crucial transformation was from libertas ecclesia to libertas persone. Mm. And there's a way in which sometimes uh, going back to the principle of libertas ecclesia is being now uh, uh, propagated in the Baptist sense that you mentioned, right? That, that each religious group has its own kind of uh, uh, way of having their own norms. It has to do also with Catholicity and what does it mean to be Catholic, Catholic, right? It means simply a particular Roman Catholic Church or it means Catholicity in terms of global universal humanity. And so I think that those are tensions within the conception of Catholic religious freedom right. that have to be taken into account, yeah. not only purely an internal kind of uh, a Roman Catholic institution, but precisely the Catholicity. It gets us down to some very case-by-case -case discussions guided by prudence. Uh, mm -hmm. so. so more questions, please. Oh, I'm sorry, you are here. I'm sorry. I didn't see. So, and then you can do it. Uh, good morning. I'm John Clark uh, from suburban Maryland in, in Gaithersburg. Um, and my, my question, it, it's a wonderful discussion, and I, I feel kind of like a, a, a Joe the plumber from the pew who stumbled into an intellectual discussion here. <laughs> I'm... <laughs> Uh, thrilled, thrilled to be here, but my question and has to do uh, more with kind of the going forward internally within the church and church leadership and formation of, of, of priests. I recall I was for a while in the seminary in 1965, as was uh, Dr. Casanova, and I remember the enthusiasm and uh, we read these documents, and people in the parishes were, were uh, trained in, in all of this. And then 
time went by and <clears throat> things have happened and leadership has changed and, and I think the culture has changed somewhat. So being out of touch uh, with uh, a, a lot of what's going on in, in uh, seminaries and, and within the hierarchy, I guess my question is this nuanced approach um, of dignitas humanae, uh, how, how much is that whole approach uh, finding its way into the formation of priests that are going to be coming out into our parishes or coming out now? And, and uh, how much has our, our uh, wonderful pope and the direction he's leading okay. possibly going to impact Thank that? You. Okay, so he would like to... <laughs> well, um, I'll let somebody who is involved with the formation of priests maybe uh, <laughs> at least say the first word. <laughs> well, I mean, I've taught, I've taught seminarians a number of times. I still have some students of the, for the ministry in my yeah. classes at Boston College and so forth. So, I, I mean, we're, I think with these issues are certainly being taught. Um, some of the younger seminarians are not wildly enthusiastic about Pope Francis, however. Um, I think they're, some of them were drawn into the seminary through the influence of people like John Paul II and Benedict, rather. So there's some tension. So the, on, the ironic twist is that people my age tend to be more progressive than some of the younger people are. But uh, why that is, I don't young, really many, know. Not many young people here and in it's the audience. By no means, that's, not a, universe, in that's <laughs> not a universal <laughs> statement. Uh, it's by no means universal, but there's a mixture here. And I don't know whether others might have some comment about that. I mean, I can only say we are blessed uh, with Pope Francis pontificate. He's the first uh, uh, pope not to have participated in the council and can embrace all the sides of the church. Can be for Latin America, can be the Pope of Liberation Theology and the Charismatics. He can uh, make saints together, John Paul II and John the Twenty Third. And I think this is the kind of church, a pluralistic church that we need. And this is the kind of dialogue I think that, that uh, the Pope is inviting us all to, to have. And I think that this is uh, 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 precisely what is important, I would say. I, I think also, just to add to that, that in my experience with formation, both in terms of religious and, and diocesan seminarians, the program of formation is so tight, tightly regulated um, by each country's Episcopal conference. And the scope of, time, the scope of, of um, courses and then the time to address these things does not give them the depth and the reflection, the opportunity for the reflection and, and what we have found in some of them is that, for example, in, in the program for priestly formation, there's only two semesters of canon law required. One is on marriage, and the other is an introduction. Now, when, when these priests get into your parish, they don't have any idea about the rights that you have or what some of the churches, the councils teaching on parishes because there hasn't been the experience. And I think we go back to what Father um, said last night that the experience is so incredibly important in understanding the church's teaching. So I think it is a problem, it, it, and it will be, but hopefully some of the formation programs will begin to in, instill more of this in it with Francis's guidance. Just w one f final is. comment on this, if I might. I think the fact of the diversity of points of view uh, or, or traditions within the church is, is in itself an important reality because whether one uh, uh, does or doesn't uh, find affinity with Pope Francis's approach currently, one cannot um, uh, ignore the fact that there are these ambivalences there are these contradictions that have been created by the, by the Second Vatican Council and its reception. And, but being part of a, a, a diverse and discursive tradition is, a, is in itself, I think, uh, an important recognition. Many people want to close that down, I, I accept. But, but I think that's the, the part of the picture that I would continue to hold on to. Okay, please. 
this person we can and then you we still have uh, Russell Jenkins from Baltimore um, a variety of uh, dioceses have been requiring uh, employees of Catholic schools or um, uh, employees of various ministries within the church um, the, within the parish church uh, or hospitals to sign contracts um, guaranteeing that they will do certain things or believe certain things or not talk about certain things or it, it's all very doctrinal and I'm wondering how this um, uh, is, is, is this something that they are legitimately doing within <coughs> the, the context of uh, Dignitatis Humani? I think, Sharon, that's your <laughs> job. The, let the kind of lawyer respond. You get to answer that. <laughs> well, there's several levels to that, and one of them is, one of the key ones is the, what is the relationship of the bishop to the apostolic work. If the school or the hospital or the institution is sponsored by a religious institute, he cannot require the teachers to sign those documents. That's one thing else, that's only the ministers now. But, well, the minister thing is, 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 is a way of trying to be exempt from the law, the civil law, um, and be able to terminate people because they have a, a um, requirement, a religious requirement. But, and, and I think that's, there's only a couple that are still doing that. Most of them have been, have listened to other lawyers and have, have dropped it. But the relationship is really important. Um, and that's why I think in, in terms of those that are diocesan, they do, I mean, they are directly under the bishop. The ones that are sponsored by religious are under the bishop for faith and morals, not for the direction of the institution or the administration of the institution. But I do think that what we have to look at is how are they expressing these requirements? And it may get to the religious, the conscience of the individuals who are made to sign these documents. Many of them cannot in conscience. And um, they should not be terminated for that. Every day I thank the religious orders, male and female, for our pluralist church. Thank you. <laughs> they are Dominicans, Franciscans, Jesuits. They hated each other, but they are all part of the church. <laughs> Please. Yes. The, the irony is I've listened to your presentations today and reflections on the development and the growth of religious freedom within the church and of... Um, on the part of the church granted towards others is that uh, in the previous few days the global Christian forum for the first time historically has brought together every tradition of Christian faith in their leadership to say how can we bring this kind of a message towards other parts of the world because Christians are there are more Christians being persecuted in the world today than at any other time of history. And the question is becoming, how can Christians be granted the rights that we are talking about today as having been granted by Christians towards others? And here I think the echo from the first presentation this morning on dialogue being the way forward is a big factor, but I would just invite your own reflections on this situation today, which is ironically finding Christians more persecuted than they've ever been. Not, their rights not being granted. Um, well, I, I think this indeed, this is a very socio-political global issue today, very important. And Pope Francis has been both uh, very outspoken about dialogue and the culture of dialogue, but also uh, basically critical of uh, the, the situation, particularly of Christians in the Middle East. So I think there is room for both to continue, to continue certainly the fundamental principles of Nostra Etate and Dignitatis Humanae, but also precisely on the basis of the fundamental uh, religious freedom, precisely to demand from states, from all states, mm -hmm. that they protect the religious freedom of everybody, not only of Christians, but of everybody, right? So this is the universal principle that has to be, that has to be maintained. So, and there is room, of course, for, for a lot 
of solidarity and, and help and, 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 and public intervention on those issues that is in and uh, I think uh, I would say also that, I mean, Paul VI recognized that himself, uh, you know, it, when, when he went to the UN, uh, when he spoke at the UN in that period, because it, it was the recognition that in order for Christians to be protected and claim those protections in parts of the world where Christians were being persecuted, the church had to have the, um, the moral authority to be able to claim that, that right for Christians by being an exemplar in respect of how it thought about the rights of, uh, of others. So I, I think they're, it's, they're actually intimately connected. Uh, they, one really can't have, uh, make a claim from a political, um, uh, uh, from, from a government if one isn't also embodying that oneself. Uh, we have time for another question. One more question before lunch, please. I'm Dennis, is this on? I'm Dennis McAuliffe, and I'm a special assistant to the president. And uh, my question is a philosophical one. Uh, as I have grown uh, up in the church and as a Roman Catholic, I've been taught to fear, above all things, relativism. And um, uh, I'm just wondering, uh, this is a, is a uh, not only a, a personal problem, but it's also a problem with my job, which is uh, I, I define as contemplatives in action, and uh, the action is in our in my case religious dialogue, and how do we engage in religious dialogue? The, the major, probably the major audience that's most difficult are seminarians. How do we engage in in this religious dialogue? If, if we believe that uh, truth is absolute and, not, uh, and that we should fear relativism. And I'm wondering if the, if the council and the current state of the church allows for a definition of relativism to be more uh, relation uh, rather than uh, an opposition between absolutism right. and relativism. Linda, obviously, yes, very uh, much part of um, I mean, that's a, that's a great question, and and I think uh, I I think that um, I would say that uh, we have within the Second Vatican doc documents of the Second Vatican Council, but more so as the the legacy of those documents have uh, ha has evolved, that one does have a, a move away from this absolutist, universalist, uh, abstract concept of, of truth, which is uh, set in sharp opposition to this uh, concept, the, the relativism and su subjectivism. I think it depends on the paradigm, the understanding of truth that one uh, functions with. Uh, and as I was saying towards the end of my paper, um, uh, I think that um, one has to understand that we are, and the, the Second Vatican Council documents did really uh, insist on this, that we are historically formed and, and contextualist and, and, and shaped historically. And that the, the language we use, the, the philosophical frameworks that we function through, these are functions of history, of philosophical frameworks. and. Uh, as we, uh, as we understand our values and communicate our values, we do that in a way that recognizes that this is the case. So uh, I don't, uh, as I was trying to suggest uh, in, uh, at the end of my paper, I don't think that there is a conflict between, on the one hand, being able to um, uh, demonstrate, if you like, the, the, um, the, the truthfulness of one's position as one has come to know it, and also being able to dialogue um, genuinely and respectfully with another who also believes genuinely uh, the, uh, in the truth of their position. Uh, and the, the justifications that we make for our positions are very much uh, uh, dependent on the moral frameworks and the philosophical frameworks that, that in which they are constructed. So I, I think that that is, I, I think we have, uh, well, 
po post-enlightenment philosophy has created this dichotomy, really, uh, that uh, I, I think is unnecessary uh, and certainly uh, can be worked through. Uh, David, probably. I would just add, I mean, I agree with you completely, and I, I think that there may be a false dichotomy between holding certain truths to be really true mm -hmm. and falling in and thinking that dialogue doesn't really fit with that. I mean, I engage in dialogue with another person because I really think that other person has a value and a worth that makes it worth listening to her or to him and that respect for the other is based on a conviction that that other person has a real worth and a real value so that I enter into a relational discussion with that person even though we may have a difference of opinion about certain issues that are very important. Uh, so dialogue and conviction about truth are not Neutral. opposed to each other at least in certain yeah. certain ways, as you were suggesting, Linda, I think. That's and true. I think sociologically one can say that the true parada paradigm shift is that from truths have rights, error have no rights, to persons have rights. And this means that also the dialogue is not between truths and errors, but it's dialogue between persons. Exactly. And this simply changes fundamentally the paradigm. Right. So I think, yes. No, go ahead. Thank no? everyone. Yeah, I would like to thank uh, uh, very much the main speaker, Linda Hogan, the respondents, and uh, uh, everybody, the questions, and all of you for your participation. Thank you very much. Very much. Excellent. Excellent panel. I'm reminded that something we found, um, De Libertate Religiosa, the first draft on religious liberty was number five, chapter five of the first draft on ecumenism, that saw the light of day in November 63. The fourth chapter was on the De Judeus, on the Jews. All the discussion, general discussion for two days and then eight days discussion just on the first three chapters, accepting in a very positive way the three chapters on ecumenism. And Cardinal Bay on December 2nd, 63 said, now look, we didn't discuss four and five, don't worry, not discussed doesn't mean not off the agenda. But the letters from the American bishops in January, February, March, Cardinal Myers stands out, unless those two chapters on the Jews and on religious liberty are discussed and approved, the credibility of the Catholic Church in the United States will suffer. And he wrote that to the Pope, he wrote it to Cardinal Bea. And so, uh, essential, uh, when Bea had his first secret meeting with the General Secretary, of the World Council of Churches, Willem Wissertuft. Uh, Wissertuft said, you can put out any statement you want on ecumenism, but unless you put out a statement on religious liberty, nobody's gonna believe you. So it shows you how incredibly important this unfinished agenda is for ecumenism and religious work and public work. We have a free lunch. <laughs> and we'll begin sharply at 1.30 because we have to have that session, which will be again on Gaudi et Spes, and then vacate the room and migrate over to Riggs Library for the last session on the vitality of Vatican II. So, um, once again, thanks to this panel for an excellent, excellent discussion. Okay.